There we go. So good morning, everyone, especially those of you who are here uh, this morning in person. Uh, glad to see many faces that I haven't seen for a long time. I'm hoping that one day I can see your face without the mask, but uh, for the time being, I'm happy that we can be together. Um, I'm also happy that I can be here preaching today. I haven't been preaching for a long time, so excuse me if I'm a bit rusty, but uh, Mike Brumel contacted me about uh, maybe three weeks ago, and he said, can you preach on this topic? I said, well, I haven't been preaching for a long time, so... Uh, uh, let me think about it, let me pray about it. And um, so as I look into the topic, I said, this is uh, a very familiar topic for everyone who have been a Christian perhaps for a long time. And um, maybe it's something that e it is easy for me to do. So I say yes, because of that. <laughs> but unknowingly, as I study and uh, prepare, I learned that there are so many things that perhaps I have put uh, as an interpretation of God's Word with my own background, with my own uh, prejudices. Uh, and as a result, I did not get as much as what I have been, uh, been able to get and, and wanting to share with you today. So uh, another challenge that I had was with the, with the title. So I chose to have this title, How to Be Young and Rich, uh, because uh, Chandra, who led us uh, in singing today, he, he, he contacted me and said, Hey, I heard that you are speaking on the rich young ruler. Uh, do you have any response song that you want us to sing? What is your title anyway? So just jokingly, I was just thinking, I haven't really prepared by then. Chandra is a guy who is always like five months ready for, <laughs> you know, for anything. So he contacted me immediately after he knew that I have said yes. So I said, uh, how about how to be young and rich? He said, and, and then he sent a smiley face. But I said, um, I don't have any other title for the time being. But then as I uh, uh, decide on, on what to talk about and how to talk about it, uh, Amanda asked me, so what is your title? So I said, how to be young and rich. And she said, uh, can we tone it down a little bit? And I said, uh, like what? Uh, like true riches or true treasure or something like that. So I said, okay, you help me decide what the title should be, but because I'm standing today and, and I'm speaking, I have to decide on my title. So my title is still How to Be Young and Rich, but maybe not the way you think of it, right? It's not about how to get rich, how to get uh, wealthy. Uh, first and foremost, I'm 54. It's a little bit too late for the first part, how to be young, I think, but I'm hoping that I am still young at heart. But uh, for some of you uh, who are over the top, maybe the first part, how to be young, is a little bit uh, uh, of the past now. Uh, but maybe perhaps I can be rich, right? So uh, stay tuned. Let's see how can we be young and rich, right? Um, we are in the series in the book of Matthew, and uh, last week, Anthony taught us on Matthew 19 up to verse uh, 15. So today I'll be covering from Matthew 19, 16 and on. So let's read the Word of God together. Starting with verse 16 of Matthew 19. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. 
your word is true. Thank you for preserving your word that we can read them, we can meditate upon them, and we can live by them today. Lord, help us to understand what it is that the Spirit wants to say to us. May your Holy Spirit open our hearts, open our mind to be able to hear your voice. Quiet our hearts, Lord, so that we may discern what is good. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, uh, first of all, let's look at this passage a little bit closer. Um, sometimes when we, as Christians, if you have been a Christian for a long time, you read a passage, and then you just kind of say, okay, I understand those words, I understand those terms, and so on, right? But let me challenge us a little bit this morning. Uh, first, what is this young man looking for? Why did he come to Jesus? So he came and he said, um, hey, dude, Jesus, do you have eternal life? Can I have some? You know, maybe from that reading, we, we, we read it as if like he is coming to ask Jesus for something. But first and foremost, what is eternal life? What is eternal life? How, you know, eternal life, when we think of eternal, is like living forever and ever, right? Uh, it's not just like long life. For sure, it's not just about number of years lived, right? That, it, that has never end. And eternal life, if let's say it is life after death, it is also a specific kind of life after death that is eternal. Definitely, he is not coming to say that I want to have eternal life in hell. I'm sure that he is looking for something eternal where he can feel blessed, he can live uh, in, in such a way that is not like people who will be in hell forever. So this eternal life that he is asking is very specific. And I try to search where, try to put my mind in, in where is this man coming from? What, what is his understanding of eternal life during that time? So I, try, I said, okay, by that time, the New Testament has not been written, so he must have gotten these ideas from the Old Testament. But to my surprise, there are only two places in the Old Testament that talk about eternal life. One is in Psalm, and one is in the book of Daniel. Now, I haven't studied it uh, very hard. Uh, I just look up, and uh, maybe we can study it together someday. So where does he get this idea about eternal life? So perhaps this event, I haven't also checked. Uh, somebody can help me check, maybe by Yusuf, our uh, in-house theologian, can help us uh, discern. When, when was this parable, or when was this story actually taking place? Was this early on in Jesus' ministry, or after he has performed and taught uh, 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 miracles and taught uh, along the way? So perhaps this guy has learned from his friends about that, hey, Jesus promises eternal life, and this is eternal life, right? So other people would have explained to him what is eternal life. So when he comes, he has this concept of eternal life, which is good, and desirable. <clears throat> and, and, uh, and what is eternal life? So we look up in the New Testament, and because New Testament is filled with um, concept of eternal life. Jesus taught it, the apostle taught it. So let's look at what uh, Apostle John said. In John 17, 3, he says, And this is eternal life, that they know you, Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Interesting. Eternal life has nothing to do with age or years we live, but it's about knowing God, the only true God, and knowing Jesus that he has sent. Another one from Apostle John, this is much later in his life, uh, toward the end, in 1 John 5, 11 to 12. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. Hmm. Gave us eternal life in, in the past. And this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So eternal life is not something that you get after you die and then live with God forever and ever. So it's the here and now. Apostle John, at the end of his life, said that, I have received eternal life. So eternal life is something that we receive 
even prior to our physical death. And it says here, whoever has the Son has life. So when do you have the Son? When do you have Jesus? It is at the time that you receive Him as your personal Savior and Lord, and God forgave your sin, and then He imputed His Spirit to live in you. That's why we are alive today in Christ, because God's Spirit now lives in us. So the, the, the eternal life that we live in is life together with God forever and ever, that He will never leave us nor forsake us. The eternal life is found in Jesus Christ, and when He comes and resides in us, that is eternal life. So we are actually living an eternal life today if we are in Christ Jesus. I don't know for sure if that is the understanding that the rich young man has at the time. I believe not, because uh, I'm sure that he just come because he has heard here and there from other people what eternal life is and how good it is. Uh, maybe from the Samaritan woman uh, welling up to eternal life that Jesus can give us this uh, li living water uh, and so on, right? So maybe it's a hearsay or some, something. But for sure, when we understand what uh, eternal life is, I'm not so sure if, if you really desire it, unless you really understand what that eternal life is, right? The second one is, uh, what is his attitude when he comes to Jesus? Behold, the man came up to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? So, we, we read from here, it's, it's pretty neutral, right? He, he neither like smirkingly come and ask. We don't know his attitude. What is his, his attitude when he comes? Was he sincere? So uh, I look up the passage in the parallel synoptic uh, Gospels, in the Gospels of uh, Luke as well as the Gospel of Mark, and see that actually in the book of Mark, chapter 10, talking about the same story from a different perspective, uh, it was recorded in verse 17 of chapter 10 of the book of Mark. And as he was setting out on his journey, or as Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So we can see very, very much different from how Matthew recorded it, that this man was not just flippantly asking about eternal life, he is sincere. Uh, he is serious. He is even desperate that he would come to the Lord, kneel before him, knowing that the Lord Jesus has the answer. So we see that he has this sincere attitude. And we remember from Jeremiah 29, 13, uh, Jeremiah says that uh, the word of God, or God said this through Jeremiah, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So we can see that this young man is a true seeker. He's looking for something. He's looking for eternal life. He's looking for God. What was his theology? And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? This, this man, perhaps, uh, we know that he is a, a Jew, right? Why? Because he has kept the commandments. He is not a Greek, right? Uh, or if he is a Greek, he has been Judea, Judea, uh, He has become a, a, a Jew. But he understood what it means. And uh, the Lord told him that if you want, if you want to inherit the, the eternal life, just do the commandments, carry out all the commandments. So for a Jew, that is what they have been taught since Moses, that if we keep all the commandments, that is when God is pleased with us. So his theology is still very much performance theology, right? So what should I do so that God is pleased, so that I can earn perhaps this eternal life? What good deed must I do to have eternal life? If you think about it, most of the world religion, even today, is performance-based. So if you do good, hopefully that you will get good results and God will bless you. And uh, uh, if you um, are kind, if you give to the poor, uh, hopefully, you know, you'll be more blessed and so on. So it's more like a performance-based religion. So he came from that theology. What good deed must I do to have eternal life? 
uh, in this slide, this is, this is the bridge illustration. People try to approach God. God has created an empty uh, hole in our heart that we would wonder and, and seek him out because uh, there is something that inherently he has built into us to hone in, to search, to find who is this creator God. But when people approach God, there are many different ways that people use. One of them is good work, maybe through being devout in my religion. Maybe if I chant enough, God would listen to me. Maybe through philosophy of life, you know, do good so that good will come to you, or with good morals. But all of that falls short of the holiness of God. None of us, even uh, our best deeds, our good deeds, is but a filthy rags, the Bible tells us. None of us. We are all so corrupted by sin that even what we think, much more what we do, is all tainted by sin. There's nothing that we can do that can actually satisfy God's uh, standard of holiness. Uh, interesting also to observe from the verses that Jesus only mentioned a few of the Ten Commandments, plus uh, one more, which is uh, more um, uh, an umbrella uh, covering, but he was more focusing on the relationship with one another. So he says, uh, you shall not murder, uh, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, and, and so on, right? So Jesus focuses on that. But... Um, We will, we will later see why is it that Jesus particularly only picked some of this, and why didn't he quote the whole Ten Commandments? Did he forget what the Ten Commandments were? I'm sure that he didn't, he didn't. but uh, as you will see that he is a skillful and master teacher, and, and we can learn a lot from that. Okay, so let, let's put a hold on that, uh, the two tablets of Moses. Uh, let's, let's go on and observe another thing. From the book of Matthew, we only see that Jesus uh, said that go sell what you possess, what you possess, and give to the poor. But then we also see that he become very sad. Uh, why is it that he become very sad? We'll, we'll look at it a little late, later. But another one is that Jesus said, "Give it to the poor." So if you have kept all these commandments. There's more, one more thing you can do. Go sell your possession and give it to the poor. So as if another performance-based uh, act that Jesus is asking him to do, is it? So go and give to the poor. Now, um, you can give without love, right? I walk from my office to my car uh, because I don't want my, my driver to pick me up at the office because then we have to make two big U-turns on Jalan Rasuna side at 6 p.m. And that's just horrendous in terms of traffic. So I asked him to wait for me uh, at the junction near Casablanca. So I always walk this uh, path. It's a short path, maybe about uh, less than one kilometer. And then just hop in the car and go back home and in apartment Casablanca. So every time I pass there, not every time, but most of the time I pass there, there's a, a young uh, lady who is a wife of uh, Pemulung, so they go out and scavenge for uh, trash, and they have a young child that is always on the grobuck. So oftentimes when I pass by, I, I hand out uh, some money to her, even to the point that she is expecting that I, every time I pass that I will give it to her, right? Uh, you can give without love. So after a while, it's just a mechanical thing that I do, when I see her, I have money in my wallet, I just give it to her, right? So you can give without love, but you can't love without giving. How about that? It's easy. If you have the money, if it's just some part of your wealth, it's not the whole wealth, it's easy for, for you to just dish out small change, right, to people and thinking that you have done your part in the performance-based religion. But you cannot love without giving, Apostle John also reminds us that if you say that you love God, but you see your brothers in need and you, you don't care about it, I don't think there's a love of God in you, right? So you can't say that you love God or love others without giving and even giving uh, when it, even when it hurts. 
So let's go back to that phrase, he had become sad. So why is it? Because it, it, Jesus was just saying that, you know, go sell your possession and give to the poor. Again, we look at the, the synoptics gospel from Mark and Luke. Jesus, what did Jesus really say to him? Jesus said, sell all that you have and give to the poor. Now, that's a bit more of a challenge. For me, when I open my wallet to give, if it is just one of the maybe 20 uh, uh, paper money in my wallet, it's nothing, right? Now, if I suddenly the Holy Spirit speaks to me and I have to give all the 20, uh, it's a little bit harder, but okay, God says so, so I give all the 20, right? But this is more than that. It's the sell all that you possess. Maybe you have in the stock, uh, uh, form of stocks, bonds, or deposits, or anything like that. Go and, and liquidate that and then give that to the poor and then, uh, and then you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Now, I don't know if you are the rich young ruler that day, you probably feel sorry that you came to ask Jesus for eternal life that you have to pay dearly. I'm not so sure if he knew at, at first he would even come to Jesus if this was the demand. So Hudson Taylor, uh, a missionary to China, uh, have this quote. Now, I didn't find this immediately. Uh, I was listening to some teaching uh, from a church in Ohio, um, McCollum, and he likes to use this phrase, Christ is either Lord of all, or he is not Lord at all. Christ is either Lord of all of your life, or he is not Lord at all. It's not just about give me a little bit of Jesus, that I can keep doing all the things that I like to do, or I can own all the things, I can live all the ways that I like. So just compartmental, compartmentalize my life, my spiritual life, to this segment, and then just give me Jesus. No, it is not like that. Christian life is not like that. And we see that so vividly in this passage, that go sell all your possession and give to the poor, that you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Christ is either Lord of all of your life or he is not Lord at all. We also see uh, Jesus said that later on when he saw this guy went away sad, he said it is difficult for the one who has wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Why is it? Why is it that it is difficult for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? Again, it is all or nothing. When you have a lot, it's going to be very difficult to give away everything, especially if you have tasty what, taste, tasted what a lot means, right? You have enjoyed your wealth. You have enjoyed uh, comfort. You have enjoyed control. You can use your money to do things, right? You can have um, significance. Uh, the, the car that you drive, you know, uh, oftentimes... When you go to a wedding or something like that in the large hotels, and then you're waiting in front uh, uh, for a car to pick up passengers, and you stand next to your cousin, uh, many cousins and aunts and uncles and all that, and other uh, people that you know, and an Alford came by and your auntie went up. And then another car came by, and it's another expensive car, right? <clears throat> and then, you know, uh, we started to feel a little bit uneasy because uh, we said, better ask our driver to go a few rounds before and maybe we should be the last one picked up because we only drive a Kijang and then the Kijang is pretty old. It's more than 10 years old. <clears throat> so you want to feel significant and sometimes what you drive, what you wear, what you, where you live matters. And, you know, when everybody is living like that, it makes it difficult for us to... Uh, meet their expectations, or at least not to be looked down because there is a standard that has been set by our community, our society, and so on. So it is difficult to give up. If you are already accustomed to that, now it was very hard for me initially, right? But uh, maybe we should borrow my brother's car, right? Uh, to go to this party or whatever. Uh, but after a while, I said, you know, it doesn't really matter because 
you know, our status is only temporal. Uh, we live as how God wants us to live, whether here, there, anywhere, whether in front of our, our relatives or whoever. Now, that, that could be a challenge for some of you, right? I, just imagine that uh, you're invited to a party tomorrow. What, what will you do in that situation? So, again, it is difficult for the rich because they cannot give up what they are already so accustomed to and feel so comfortable with. In 1 Timothy, Apostle Paul uh, said this to, to, Timoth to the young Timothy uh, in, in chapter 6. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, the storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of what of that which is truly life. So for the rich, the admonishment was that uh, don't be haughty. Uh, riches is temporal. It's uncertain, right? Um, we have people uh, asking questions like, you know, this, this, the stock market is at all-time high, uh, you know, the impending crash will happen, you know, should, should we as Christians be concerned and so on. So there are questions like that because you know that riches is very uncertain wherever you put it. Uh, but be rich in, uh, in, in doing good, in good works, and be generous and ready to share. That was the admonition for the rich. Another verse that comes to mind is from Matthew 6, 24, when the Lord says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and Satan. You know, oftentimes I said, the, the rational thing here is to say God and Satan, right? But why is it that Jesus is teaching that you cannot serve both God and money? Because money can be set up as an idol. Money can be set up to be replacement for God. Now, it's true that uh, the teaching of Scripture is also that we should work so that God uh, can bless us through our labor in order for us to feed our family, to meet our needs, and so on, right? So it doesn't just mean that we should just not have, have any money. Money in itself is not inherent, in, uh, inherently bad. But the love of money is what is being questioned here, right? And also another point is that you don't have to be very wealthy. Uh, if you come in here and you said, you know, I'm not very wealthy, uh, okay. But some people who are not wealthy can also be enslaved by the desire to be wealthy. So the desire for money so you don't have to be wealthy to have this problem, but you can be poor, but your desire is to get wealth can also cripple you, can also displace God from your life and put that as your primary pursuit. Another thing I want to, to touch on is that uh, what Jesus said, go sell all that you possess and give to the poor and, and you will have treasure in heaven. What does that mean, treasure in heaven? As Christians, oftentimes we just think about, you know, treasures in heaven, yeah. Some people, uh, even one of our uh, friends that are very um, well first with scriptures, he would say, uh, but Yusuf, because of all that he is doing, he cares for the poor, he goes to Bantar Gebang, which is very smelly, but yet he devoted his whole life for helping the poor. So he will have a penthouse in heaven, and I'll live in the basement and maybe outside, right? Sometimes we have these ideas because somebody <laughs> have told us that that's how it is going to be. So if you do good now, you will receive your great reward in heaven. But when we think of, then it's true, the Bible says that you will receive your reward, right? And you will receive inheritance and treasure in heaven. But what is that? It's not really well specified, and you can read it from different angles. And as sinful, depraved, mind that I have, 
I interpret it as like how I live in this world, in the materialistic world that we live in. So if I give to the poor today, and I will get a big mansion when I go to heaven, what better investment can you have, right? That's, that's like life long, lifelong savings. No difference. But some of us think that that is what it meant, that when we give to the poor, we're actually having a uh, treasure box or whatever, right? We put it in here and then, ka it's actually going into our celengan uh, in heaven. But is that really what it is? Otherwise, it's again performance-based religion. It's just now or later, right? <clears throat> so what is heaven like? We all long for heaven. Hopefully one day, um, you know, there's no more pain, no more suffering. So what is heaven like? Now, Scripture talks a lot also about what heaven is like. We, we oftentimes focus ourselves to the materialistic part of heaven, which is the, the street is covered with gold, is paved with gold, right? And, and so on and so forth. And also, even in Scriptures, if you have the King James Version of the Bible, <clears throat> and if you read from John 14, 2, it says this, Jesus said this, In my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. So in my mind, immediately, wow, in my father's house, there's many mansions. So penthouse is available. Uh, immediately, that's, that's what I think. But as I search scriptures and look at other translations, more and more people don't translate that word. If you have to go back and look at the Greek word for that, it can be home. It can be rooms, right? So if you look at uh, other translations like NIV and ESV, he, they will just say that my, father, my father's house have many rooms, or there are many rooms in my father's house. If you look at even translations like the New Living Translations or the Message, uh, there is more than enough room in my father's home. Even if we think about in my father's house there are many rooms, uh, you know, I, we only have one child, one daughter, so she has her own room. But my driver will be uh, having the, the fourth child uh, this Friday. His wife will be giving birth to the fourth child. And I asked him, so do you have enough rooms in your house for all these children? So he said, yeah, my son and I, we just slept in the living room, and my wife uh, has the room with the youngest, and then my daughter has her own room. So what happened when your new baby comes? Well, well, we'll make do. But when we think about, when we read this, my father's house has many rooms. Well, I'm going to have my own room, you know. Uh, you know, maybe everybody has their own room. We all have privacy. We all can live, you know, comfortable life in heaven. But again, we are reading this based on our materialistic way of thinking. I like the, the translation where it says, there is more than enough room in my father's home. So don't worry, we will all be together with God. You know, uh, your young children especially, if let's say that we're going to do a special night tonight. So mom and dad, we're all going to sleep in the living room. You know, everybody, we, we, we take our blankets out, we even make a, a, a makeshift tent, and we're just going to camp out. And all the children are so excited right? And the next day roll in and they say, can we do that again? They even don't want to go to sleep in their own room because they want to be with... So that's how it is. When we love our, our father, when we, when we love our brothers and our sisters in Christ, we want to be together. We don't want to be just, you know, I have my own room, you have your own room, you have your TV in your room, I have my TV, I just enjoy my life. That's not the Christian life. Christian life is about being together. We enjoy each other because we are all children of the living God who has inherited um, this right to be called children of God. We want to be together. So again, I think there are many errors in my own thinking. As I, as I research this and, and learn about this, I realize how much that when we read scriptures, we read it with our own motives, we read it with our faulty thinking, our sinful nature, and so on. So what is the treasure that Jesus talked about? When you get to heaven, you will have the treasure. 
it is not going to be taking out the gold from the pavements and put it in your room, okay? So that's not the true treasure. The true treasure itself is being with God. God is our treasure. God is our treasure. So when we go to heaven, he is our treasure. Now, do you really want to go to heaven? If you don't think that God is your treasure, if God is everything that you desire on this earth, going to heaven is going to be forever, you know? Would you be able to enjoy God just being around Him? And that is your treasure? For some people, hey, I, I didn't sign up for this. I signed up for that material treasure. I signed up for the gold, I signed up for the rooms. I signed up for the mansions. No, true treasure is when we have Christ and Christ is enough, when He is our all, that we are willing to let go everything else for Him because He is worth it. Because He is so good. There's only one who is good, and He is God. So when we search for heavenly treasure, for the treasure in heaven, we're seeking to be with God, that we will have God we will be his, and he will be us, ours. That is the true treasure. Let me di digest, uh, digress a little bit. Uh, Jakarta is always prone to banjir, yeah, flooding. In 1998, there was a big flood. I know this was a long time ago, but I remember it vividly because uh, it was the time when I was still dating, who is now my wife, 1995, 1996, right? 1996, okay. Correction, 1996. And uh, I always make it a point when I finish work, I go to her house and just spend time with her because I want to be with her. You know, I, I, uh, I, would, I would do anything to be with her. <clears throat> so one day it was raining so hard and then uh, flooding was happening everywhere. So, uh, you know, I want to be with her, but the flood is rampant and, you know, uh, many cars were already, uh, already broke down because of the water. But I did drive as far as my car can go, as near to her house as possible. But it's still far. My car would not go anymore. So what do I do? So I said, okay, I took up. I, I uh, roll up my, my pants, right, and uh, go down from the car. And my pants was this high, but the water was this high. So it was, it, it was, not, it was even not uh, uh, fruitful that I have to roll up my, plant, my pants. So I was all wet from here, drenched. And I was walking in muddy, smelly, dirty water. But I walk and make my way toward her house. It was still far away, maybe about five, six hundred meters away in, you know, waist-high, uh, dirty flood water, just to be with her. Why? Why would you do such a thing, right? Because it's worth it. Just that moment of being with her. Now, of course, after that, I have to go home again, right? <laughs> Going through that. But it's worth it. And we do that because there's love, there's affection, there's, there is a desire to be with somebody who you love. When we come to talk about loving God, are we all out? Is it all or nothing? Or is it just an add-on? My wife probably says that, Okay, let's test it again if the flood comes. <laughs> now, it's not just at that one moment that you have your first love with Christ, but He wants you to continue to have this close relationship with Him forever and ever. That You would, you would desire Him more than anything, as we sang the, the last uh, song that we, we sang during worship. He reminds the, the churches uh, in Revelation, he says, but I have this against you. I know that you're doing all the good things and so on, that you have abund abandoned the love you had at first. The love that you have at first, just like that love that I have for my girlfriend just before we got married. 
you know, that desire, that longing to be with Christ, to do what He wants me to do, to live my life in such a way that I'm pleasing Him in every way. And He said that if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. If you don't do that, you cannot be my disciple. If anyone who wants to follow Christ, and it is not all or nothing, you cannot be his disciple. It cannot be just half-hearted. You are not in love with Christ. Because it says, uh, love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. All. And in fact, uh, the Jeremiah passage I quoted to you earlier, Jeremiah 23, it says that, if you seek me, you will find me. The young man was seeking God. And he found Jesus in a way, but not completely, because he went away sad. But if you seek me with all your heart, without the all, it is not possible for us to be a follower of Christ. So it is a call to radical following, not just an add-on, not just because there's something good that will result in something good, but it is because my life depends on it and I love Him and without Him, I, I can do nothing. Christ is either Lord of all or He is not Lord at all. So going back to that list of commandments that Jesus gave. So why is it that he did not mention anything, perhaps, on the other tablets? Because if you look at it, what is the first commandment? You shall not have other God. You shall not have other God before me. What was the God of this young man? It's his wealth. You shall not have other God before me. Jesus could have immediately, he comes, do the first commandment, right? But Jesus did not do that. Why? Because he is a master, skillful teacher. He wants the young man to learn that you cannot say that you love God if let's, the way you live in this world is not going to be congruent. So his problem is not about being covetous because he's already wealthy. Well, some Wealthy people are still covetous because there's always going to be somebody who is more wealthy than you. But it doesn't mean that only wealthy people are covetous. People who want to be wealthy also can be covetous of the wealth of the rich people. But that's not his problem. His problem is actually with the first commandment. His heart was displaced, or God was displaced in his heart. It wasn't God that is in the center, that all, that everything is God first. Something else has replaced that. What is it in your life that you value more than Him? So let me just leave you with that question. What is it that you value more than Him? Probably wealth. Or, or what is it that you are willing to let go God, that you want to hold to that thing or that person or whatever that dearly? It could be a boyfriend, a girlfriend, that you know that this relationship is not going to please God, but you, you feel like you can't live without it. And you're ready to, to let go all the things that God has so kindly and gently show you. It could be a pursuit of wealth, as I said earlier. It doesn't mean this is just a problem of rich people. Even people who want to become rich can also displace God with that desire of wanting to chase after the wealth in this life. What is it that you value more than Him? Let me give you an, uh, an encouragement. We read in Mark 10, toward the end, uh, Jesus looked around and said to His disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? 
this young man, he has kept all the commandments. He's wealthy. Jesus looked at them and said, With men, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Now, in, in some of these synoptic passages, uh, it was also described that Jesus looked at him and loved him. Now, this person is a special person, I, I believe, in Jesus' heart. We don't know the end of the story. This is not the end, I hope. And when Jesus said this is impossible, uh, but it is possible with God. So I, I truly want to believe that this man one day realized how infinitely more valuable God is. That how, trash, how the, the, the true treasure, who the true treasure really is, and is willing to forego his wealth to pursue God. I don't know where you are today. Maybe there's something that you pursue more than God. But let's not give up because God is in the process of stirring up things around us, of creating situations to draw us nearer to him. He is seeking for those who he will save. And, and for those of you who are still seeking something else other than God, perhaps we don't know, perhaps we have been misled in understanding how the true riches really is, who God is, and how infinitely valuable he is. And for the rest of us who are living day-to-day -day Christian life, trying to obey God with the uh, utter challenges that we face in our workplace, in our family, may Hudson Taylor's uh, quote ring true um, each, each day, each moment of our life. Christ is either Lord of all, or he is not Lord at all. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your passage of Scripture that is cutting to the heart. Lord, we know none of you, none of us, have this pure desire to always want you. We have fallen away. We have failed you. In fact, the song reminds us that we have a heart that prone to wonder, prone to leave the God that we love. So we pray, Lord, that your grace would be sufficient for each one of us to live out this calling, to lay down our life, to pick up our cross, and to follow you daily. Grant us the strength, renew our minds, and lead us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.